Welcome to the California College of Arts. My name is Matt Sillity and I have the pleasure of sharing our, um, I used to say our brand new CCA MFA in Comics program, but we've been here for a while now. It's really exciting. Um, please do me a favor, raise your hand if this is your first time at CCA. Wow, well welcome. Um, we weren't being elitist when we blocked off the first three rows. We were actually saving room for our graduate cartoonists. These are three cohorts of students who have, uh, some of this is their third summer with us, some it's their second summer, and some have been here for an entire week. And um, what I'd like them to do for just a moment is to stand up, turn around, and let's give a nice round of applause for being here today. And yeah, you guys can stand up. When we started this program um, three years ago, uh, our first cohort took a chance on something new and they came out here and they've come back twice. So I think things are going okay. Um, but as part of our program, we've been fortunate enough to have our Comics in the City uh, speaker series and we've had a lot of fantastic cartoonists and writers and artists and editors come out and talk with us. Um, but tonight we're, we're thrilled to have um, just really one of our favorite favorite illustrator, writer, animator, all the aboves with us. Um, uh, but before we bring Mike out, I want to uh, congratulate someone else. And that's, um, before this program started, uh, CCA had an adjunct instructor named Justin Hall, who was teaching his very first class and um, became such an important part of CCA and such an important part of our program that he recently uh, was promoted to uh, ranked professor at CCA. So let's give it a Um, with that, uh, we'll have Justin up here to give some opening remarks, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, after the talk, I'll remind everybody, but uh, on, at 195 Dejaro, around the corner here, we're going to have a nice reception with a little bit of food and beverage, and you're all welcome to join us. So, um, let's get things underway. Uh, Justin. So yeah, this is an incredible honor. Uh, Mike Mignola has had a remarkable and varied career. He grew up in the Bay Area and attended this school back when it was CCAC, the California College of Arts and Crafts. Um, after graduating in 1982, he uh, headed to New York City to seek his fortune in the comic book industry. After a few starts and stuff, we'll get into that. Um, he landed a regular penciling job with Marvel Comics Rocket Raccoon miniseries and began a, began a decade-long uh, stint doing art for Marvel and then DC superhero books. 1993, Mignola moved over to Dark Horse Comics and for the new Legend imprint created Hellboy. Uh, this was his first creator-owned work and launched him as a writer, world builder, and creative impresario. Uh, Mignola has used the character in his world to explore his love for classic horror, folk, folk tales, and mythologies, along with a bevy of other amazing creators he brought into play in his sandbox. Uh, Hellboy has generated many comics collections, spin-off comic series, prose novels, animation projects, and even two live-action films in the last 22 years. Um, Hellboy has won Mignola numerous Harvey and Eisner Awards, which are the American Comic Book Industry's highest uh, honors. Mignola has continued to work outside of the Hellboy universe and outside of comics with prose novels, illustrations, and animation work. Uh, but now with the ongoing series Hellboy in Hell, he's back to his main love, which is making comics. Uh, so please help me welcome the great Mike Mignola. Five minutes ish of uh, kind of question Q and A here, and then uh, it'll be open for questions from the audience. So please have some some ideas for for Mike. Um, so uh, you um, when when you were here at CCAC, um, I, I gather there wasn't you know there certainly wasn't a comics program back then. No. Uh, <laughs> could you have imagined this? I mean, this is no. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't imagine dropping the A off the end or the 
C, C of the end, which is probably a good move since everyone always laughed when they said arts and crafts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, there's it a fair description of the school back then, by the way. So there was basketball leaving. I always heard that there was. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and they, there has been this kind of remarkable cultural shift. You think about, uh, you know, people are here for comics and comic books, and um, that was not something that was part of academia, certainly, uh, back then. Uh, I, I mean, the reason I laugh when you mm. said, seek my fortune, uh, one of the gigantic differences, in those days, nobody made money doing comics. I mean, there were people who made a living doing comics, mm -hmm. um, but certainly there was nothing like what has happened since, where some guys have gotten filthy rich doing comics. It just wasn't in the cards. None of us imagined it even in those days. So there was even less reason to go into comics, if you were looking at it as a, as a career. I went into comics like a lot of people because everything else seemed like it was going to be boring and we just wanted to draw <laughs> some stupid shit. <laughs> um, so, so how do you see this cultural shift then? I mean, it, it's an economic shift, a cultural shift, um, and do you feel like your career has played any kind of part in that? Or No, I mean, I don't... Uh, if, if my career has played any part, it is that somebody with the extremely limited set of skills that I have could end up where I ended up. Um, I think I'm just one of those guys who was in the right place at the right time, drifted along in a particular path that's possible to do. Uh, it involves you know, some, some lucky breaks along the way, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, one of the things that still astounds me is how few people do try, even try to do what I tried to do, considering it's very clear the benefits of you know, financial and creative benefits to doing what I did. I mean, I've been, for 20 years, 22 years, I've been, I've had no deadlines, uh, really, I mean, no real deadlines, um, and I've been drawing whatever I want, and I got a couple movies. So, you know, not that that's really a goal, but... Who doesn't have that as a goal? And, and the thing is to get paid all that time to do whatever you whatever you want. So, so a lot of this is the shift to the possibility of creator-owned material in the industry, right? Because that wasn't, that wasn't really possible earlier. Right. Well, it was possible. Uh, guys were doing it before I got into comics, but it was a select few guys. It became extremely mainstream when these knuckleheads from Marvel Comics went and formed the image. And these guys were, I mean, some of these guys were just, I mean, I think I'm stupid. <laughs> you can see, this is a safe space. It's not. Good. But, but I mean, these are guys. I, oh God, I, I forgot. We're on camera. <laughs> no, but I mean, these were guys, and none of them were really dumb guys. So they wouldn't have done this move if they were really dumb guys. But they were guys that were younger. Some of them were younger than me. A lot of them were younger than me, and they were they were knucklehead strong superheroes who decided to go off and do their own thing. And that changed the industry. When you saw these guys, who had all gotten a, a measure of success doing work at Marvel Comics, and they thought, well, wait a minute. Most of what we're earning is for the company. What if we went someplace else where we got the lion's share of the profits? And, I mean, you look at someone like Jack Kirby, who kind of tried to do that earlier, right? I mean, he created all the these properties for Marvel and DC as well, and then essentially kind of didn't reap the... Yeah, he, I mean, he did make Marvel Comics. I mean, he just, there was never anybody else like him before or since. He created all that stuff and probably thought he would always be taken care of. And I, I, I don't know Jack. I, I, I never got a chance to really talk to him. Um, so I don't know where his thought process was where he realized, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm making up all this stuff for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but again, the business was so different then, there weren't the avenues for creating your own stuff. Uh, it was possible to do, but it, it, it was so outside the norm. Mm -hmm. I think he, was, he did some of the first creator on material outside of the underground. Yeah, very, very near the end, Jack did some stuff. But, um, but yeah, the bulk of his career, I mean, was, was 
completely creating Marvel Comics and then going over and doing a big chunk of DC Comics. And it comments a lot of work. At some point, you just get tired of doing that much work. So, but okay, but you went back to comics. We'll we'll, we'll get to that because I'm fascinated by, by that. But there's your whole career. You've got all these different kinds of sections of it where you did different uh, tasks. Um, you've done pretty much everything in comics. I don't know if you've ever lettered or colored, but you've done. I, I did. I did color one cover. Oh, it was sure. blue. <laughs> blue and white. And I, I scribbled in on a Xerox to show the editor what it was supposed to be, and he goes. Let's just pay you for color. We'll just use that. <laughs> it was your blue period. Yes. <laughs> so, so you started as a as an inker, yes. Yes. And then did some penciling. Yes, because I was too I, I was too afraid to try drawing comics. I knew I was too terrible to draw comics, and I thought any bonehead can be an inker because you're just tracing what somebody else drew. And I'd been inking my own stuff, so I figured how how hard can it be to ink somebody else? until you actually get a job where you're making somebody else. And the guy has, he's only half drawn everything, and you're kind of guessing up what things were supposed to be. And I had no idea what I was doing, and I was horrible at it. So I moved to New York to be an inker, and realized that I'm not good enough for the entry, for the lowest position <laughs> in the business. And then, you get, and, and, this and I have no other skills of any kind. <laughs> so you, you're forced, I mean, I did manage because I was, you know, uh, pathetic and saved me, and I was at I was I moved to New York with no money, so I'm like, ah, please. And so I got a little bit of work while I was there, enough so that I thought I had an inking career. So I moved back to Oakland, and then they went, oh, that starving kid who's not very good, he's not here anymore. So why are we going to mail stuff across the country to the starving kid? Because he's probably somebody else. He's, he's somebody else's problem. We don't see his sad, malnourished face. So, <laughs> my career in. And so I ran into the editor who had given me my start as an inker, who had politely informed me that I really wasn't very good at this. Um, but it always pushed me to draw, because my portfolio was all drawing. Mm -hmm. I'd never drawn pages, but I did a lot of pinups and kind of fake covers and stuff. And he, I was just too chicken shit to, to try it. So having no other skills, when I ran into him and he said, yeah, I, just, I noticed your inking career is also ending. Are you ready to try drawing comics now? And so that's how I became a terrible pencil. And, and that's, <laughs> that, that, that was Rocket Raccoon. No, no, I did a couple horrible jobs before Rocket Raccoon. Oh, okay. But back then also, they were publishing so much. And the, the first writer I worked with, he was one of these guys who would write like 32 books in a month. He was just crazy with stuff. And you know, every writer's got more books than they have artists for. So I did these couple terrible jobs with him. Um, and then he had this rock raccoon thing in his back pocket. And by, back then, everything sold. So I was like, well, maybe this kid who's not good at superheroes, maybe he could draw this raccoon comic. So this was like the 80s, kind of early 80s boom. And yeah. Was, there was enough money floating around to yeah. have a series like Rock Raccoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I remember, I actually read when I was a kid. I remember that series quite. A lot of people have fond memories of it. Not, and, and not me as so much. Well, but, but, <laughs> but, now, the characters everywhere. now the characters everywhere, isn't that? Yeah, and, and there's a lesson there. <laughs> because, oh, you must be on Easy Street. You do Rock Rack Moon. No, no. They've reprinted it 3,000 different ways in the last year because of the movie. $17 from royalties. Yay! <laughs> hey, kids, that's what we're from Marvel Comics. That's, we'll do it for you. That's not even a sandwich in the Bay Area. So, no. <laughs> um, so, so from there, like you had about 10 years with DC and Marvel. Yeah. And during that time... Because I got better. You got better, yes. and, and you not only got better, but you developed this very specific kind of signature style that has really worked for you. you there's a Magnolia style that people can kind of point to. So how did, um, uh, you know, which are, you know, lots of shadows, kind of clunky, uh, graphic shapes. Entirely and made of covering things you don't know how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> tell us the secret. <laughs> if, if you leave something white, it's very clear you didn't draw anything. But if you put a big honking shadow there, people think there's stuff there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when did you figure this out? Was it was was it an aha moment? Because I, I look at like Cosmic Odyssey. I think was maybe one of the first times when it started, to, or Gotham by Gaslight or something, where you really started to gel. But like, 
What, was it a specific aha moment, or was there kind of this gradual study process for you to develop your stuff? It's, it's definitely a process of trial and error. And, and I, my stuff was radically different when I started. Uh, and I don't know where you'd even start to see what I was doing. But Cosmicase was huge. Even though I think I'd done a couple things that were sort of okay before that. Also, working in comics, most of the time you're not inking your own work. So, uh, which is good, because apparently I was too terrible to be my own inker. Um, so a lot of jobs you do, you may be further along than the public ever sees, because you have an inker on your work who doesn't, you know, necessarily compliment what you're doing, or, again, in comics, all the time you're drawing this stuff so fast that you don't really have time to do your best job. You're just kind of basically trying to keep your head above water. Um, Cosmic Odyssey, I sp took almost a year, I think, to do. And I spent so much of that time looking at Jack Kirby's work, who I'd grown up on Jack's stuff, but as a mat relatively mature artist, I never really spent a lot of time studying it. But I was drawing his characters for, you know, I, you look at his stuff for reference, and the abstraction in his work really appealed to me. And I'd like shadows and stuff anyway. I was, you know, my big influences when I was a kid was Frank Rosetta and Bernie Wrightson, and then a lot of the old, older American illustrators that influenced them. Uh, so I, I had the shadows in there, but Jack stuff made me become more abstract and more impressionistic with how I did all that stuff. Were you? But but it was slaughtered by the inker. So if you were to look at the pencils for Cosmic Odyssey, which I which I still had copies of, you'd see my style was actually much further along than the finished job right. shows. Um, were you also looking to any of the European cartoonists like Alex Toth or Hugo Pratt or Alex an American? By the time I was in comics for a while, you get to the point where you're kind of just referencing yourself. So I was always looking at people, but I'd already gone through that phase, which was a scary phase, but lasted about two years, where every day I wanted to be a different guy. I gotta be this guy. No, wait, look at this guy over here. I should be that guy. And you know what the hell you're gonna do. And then when you start drawing comics, you gotta draw them so damn fast that fortunately, hopefully, you've looked at enough cool guys that that stuff starts to all kind of mix together in your head. Um, what now? Uh, uh, when you started into Hellboy, were you inking? You were inking your own work at that point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, eventually I did ink a few of my own jobs, uh, and yeah, with Hellboy, it was. It, you know, I remember Craig Russell, who inked me on several jobs, pointed out that he loved inking me because it was so damn easy. Uh, I think he said he could do four pages a day. And at some point, you go. He's making a lot of money. Right? <laughs> I'll see if I can eat four pages a day of my own stuff. Uh, and plus then, you know, all the artwork is yours, which is a very nice additional means of income. And yeah, so. Um, do you enjoy that process now? I mean, do you actually enjoy the penciling to inking to? I, I do. Um, I'm very tired and very old now, so I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. My back uh, is paying for it, 30 years of seven days a week hunching over a drawing table. They should teach a class in not sitting all day long. Uh, and, and because someday you're gonna be old and, and you're gonna pay for it. Um, I do, the thing I enjoy about inking, if you look at the way I draw now, it's all shapes and the blacks aren't filled in. It's not like I draw a figure and then start, oh, I gotta shade this and shade this and shade this. It's just shapes. And so when I ink, it's kind of like, it, you get to see if it works or not. And, and, you know, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. But at this point, I just basically see it as black and white shapes, so I don't even pencil in the black areas. I just kind of go, this is a shadow, and this is a thing. And so you can just do that digitally? You can just kind of, you know, f finish up the inks digitally? With no, 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 no. Because you do that, there's no original art. Oh, yes. And then you can't sell it. <laughs> Plus, I don't know. <laughs> There's a program here at MFA and Comics. I don't know if you yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll look at your portfolio, but okay. Right. I doubt I can get in. I don't have the. If, if I were to go back right now, I don't have the entry level skills to enter my own business. Um, which is good. Well, I, because I don't, I, I don't know how to use a scanner. I don't know how to do all the, the most fundamental stuff. Any kind of coloring on the computer and stuff. It's like just a magic trick to me. I'm very good at working with people who know how to do things, and I say, can you make that browner? <laughs> uh, 
that's, that's my level of okay, so, logical expertise. So I did want to ask you about your basic, I mean, you're, um, you have this wonderful kind of creative love affair with Dave Stewart, right? I mean, he's incredible. I mean, he's yes. one of the most amazing colorists. Um, and you also have, uh, work with a letter, which... Yeah, I don't even know who, which, who he is. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's whoever Dark Horse gave me. He, I don't, I, I miss, once upon a time, we, all the lettering was done on the board on the yeah. pages, and that was so much better. And when I started doing the Hellboy stuff, I was having the lettering done on the boards, and then I would draw the word balloons. And that's the thing I, I miss the most, because you can get so much more personality in your stuff if you draw the balloons. The great Mobius once said, he could understand somebody else coloring your work, but he could not get over the fact that Americans didn't letter their own stuff, mm -hmm. because there's so much personality in the lettering. I'm not crazy enough to letter my own stuff. Maybe if people spoke a lot less, I would take a stab at it. But just doing the balloons, the shapes of the balloons, how much air you leave in the balloon, how you curve the, the thing. That's where my hand, <laughs> yes, it's like in. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is where my hands are tied by working with somebody else. I mean, there's always, there's so many stages I go through of torturing different people. And one of them, with my editor, is when my stuff is lettered, going through it, you know, JPEGs, and saying, can you move the tail a little bit this way, move the tail a little bit that way. The tails it should be a little bit thinner and it should curve a little bit more this way. Oh, you're, you're a micromanager, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> Dave Stewart, thank God he tolerates me. I was probably the first person who used Dave full-time as a colorist. Dave was on staff at Dark Horse, and he was doing, like, separations, whatever the hell that is. Uh, and he, he bailed out a job where the guy who was coloring my stuff did a bad job. And Dave came in and fixed a bunch of stuff. And so I said, let me have that guy. Because he, I told him things and he listened, which was not what the other guy was doing. And so um, I'd like to think I've taught him a few things over the years, um, but he tolerates me. And he's really become the glue that holds all our line books together. Um, but it's so important to have a relationship with a guy. I mean, again, 20 years probably we've been working together. So when I say, give me that night sky blue, or give me those, this one's all those purple grays. Because there's certain browns that I hate. There's certain other colors that always work good together. I can reference various jobs we've done before. Um, so when you, when you started with Hellboy, you also started writing for the first time, right? So, yeah. so uh, uh, and uh, from what I understand, the first Hellboy was co-written with John Byrne. Yes. So was this because you needed, uh, you didn't have all the skills? To I have no confidence in any of my abilities. Uh, <laughs> it is only by the fact that I can't do anything else at all that I managed to be successful. Uh, this could be a therapy session as well. No, <laughs> that's the only thing I ever did, turned into that. Eventually it was just, give me a couch. Um, but it's, it's, it's this. Um, yes, I didn't have the confidence to write my own stuff. I had plotted a story at DC, a Batman story. And that was actually pretty cool, because I just made up a story about Batman in a graveyard, because I don't want to draw buildings or that fucking car. So, <laughs> I did that, and a, a buddy of mine scripted it, because I didn't know what the hell Batman would say. I couldn't give a shit about Batman. Um, but I was like, oh, I drew a whole job of stuff that I wanted to draw, and Batman's easy. That's the one thing about Batman, he's easy. Black shape, couple point, ding, done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I did that, and then I went, oh, maybe I could do this. I could at least make up a pile of stuff that I want to draw. I worked with John Burr in the past. We were, at that time, I had a, a good relationship. And I said, uh, you know, would you, would you help me out on this. And my idea was, I will just give him a list of shit I want to draw, and he'll make it into something. Um, getting a list of things I'd want to draw is the most important thing. I didn't want to draw cars, I didn't want to draw buses, I wanted, you know. Let's so get the things you didn't want to draw also. Was, yeah, yeah, I'm important. avoiding all the stuff that's hard. Uh, <laughs> no giraffes. Giraffe, I mean, because you get a photo of a giraffe, that would be cool, but it doesn't have wheels. It doesn't, it isn't made of metal. Um, that kind of shit is, a nightmare for me. Um, but then over the period of time we talked about the story, he, John always knew I should write it myself. So he really, and I got, I, I give him so much credit for this, he really never tried to make this thing our thing. It was always my thing. 
So when I said, well, actually, I kind of got a plot, and he's like, fine, and I drew the whole job, and then I had to write it so he would know what to write. Because, you know, you look at the thing, you don't know what the guys are saying to each other. So I tempted in all the dialogue and everything, and he wrote it, or rewrote it, and it kind of went, huh, I kind of liked it better the way I had it. <laughs> and, which I think he knew would happen. Uh, and so by the end of that first series, he was like, you're on your own, son. It was very much like having training wheels. And you don't realize how wobbly that bicycle is until those training wheels come off. So the second one, the one I wrote, the first one I wrote myself was a nightmare because it was just me and the blank paper. And I'd never had that. Uh, I would, you know, when you draw something ordinarily, somebody else is going to write it, somebody else is going to color it. The first Hellboy I wrote myself, not only was I writing it myself, the book was going to be published in black and white. So at no point anywhere in the process was a professional going to be involved. <laughs> that was scary as shit. Uh, that, was, that was nasty. Uh, I forgot it was black and white. Yeah. yeah. It was originally serialized in black and white. Yeah. So, so what, uh, you, you talked about you know, this kind of a learning curve initially for the first 10 years of kind of developing your visual style. Was there a, a similar learning curve to developing your writing style and narrative style? Yeah, I mean, it never would have occurred to me have a writing style, um, and I don't think there was anything present on the first Hellboy. Uh, in fact, John and I had discussed certain things we thought would be a good good approach to writing it, which didn't work at all. This kind of internal monologue, this detective kind of, and then I did this, and then I thought this, I lose all that. Um, and so the first one, I'm just drowning. I'm just floundering around, not knowing what I'm doing. The third one I did clicked. But in a very weird way, because I did it, I had so much fun doing it. I took an old Irish folk tale I'd always wanted to adapt and turned it into a Hellboy story, and it was goofy, and it was weird, and it was funny. And I don't know what kind of frame of mind I was in where I just had so much fun doing this thing. And when it was done, it was like I sobered up and went, oh shit, nobody, nobody will publish this. Nobody. I was really in a panic. I thought it was unpublishable. And I remember going out to lunch with an art dealer friend of mine. And, he, and I took the job, and he looked at it. And at the end, he said, it's the best thing you've ever done. It's not just better than anything you've ever done. It's head and shoulders above anything you've ever done. And it was because I just relaxed and had fun doing it. But what was scary about it is when I looked at it, I mean, A, it was, I was being goofy. There's a lot of humor in it. And it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen before. One of the things that um, uh, that I really find interesting about your work is, I mean, it's obviously very much about horror is you know, incredibly important to you, but but there is humor to it, and there is a kind of um, you know I feel like humor and horror are oftentimes flip sides of the same coin. There's a kind of camp element to a lot of horror, and you seem to be aware of that. And yeah, I don't, I, I never think of camp at all, um, but I only I deal with a lot of stuff in a humorous way. That's just my personality, though it's probably hard to tell. Um, but it, it just, I, and I think there, there's a funny thing with Hellboy. When I started writing, especially writing the villains, uh, and this wasn't really the case with this, this story I'm talking about, but in the later ones, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would get caught up trying to be Shakespearean, you know, or biblical with these big prophecies and shit like that. And then there's a part of my brain that gets so embarrassed by what I'm writing, then that's where an Hellboy steps in and says something like, you know, big talk for a guy with no pants. And I found that was so important to let the reader know, yes, I know that's stupid. I know that's silly. So that became the juggling thing that was in there. And I remember at some point talking to a friend of mine, a friend of mine was uh, doing this Godzilla comic at the same time. And we were comparing notes, you know, I had just done a story, he had done a story, and, and we're, he said, you know, we're like, yeah, you know, the, the new one's pretty good, it's got a couple good gags in it, and I realized, at what point did that become important, that there's a couple, there need to be a couple good gags, or a couple good funny lines, uh, and there are a couple stories I've done, it wasn't done in my head until I went, oh, the scene with the monkey with a gun, you know, a couple little dialogue bits, and I went, that one's ready to go, because it's got that in there. I did read that you, you tried your hand at a, at a Conan story, and that that was one of the problems, right? Because Conan has no sense of humor, no. right? <laughs> and he says ridiculous things like, 
by yeah. Crom, <laughs> which was cool when you were 13 years old and you were reading it. It was great, but when you had to actually write a guy, and I was like, do I actually have to have him say this? I mean, I know it, that's who he is and that's what he says, but oh, holy shit, that's hard. So, so Hellboy, I mean, as, as a character, is really interesting because he does have a sense of humor. He's got a kind of normal guy thing to him, a regular Joe kind of thing. And he also is a demonic monster. Right, basically a demonic monster. Right. Basically basically monster. Right. So how, what, how do you view that kind of collection of different... Oh, it just seemed, you know, normal to me. I mean, the thing is, writing Hellboy, when I started writing, the first thing I knew is I was I, one of my major goals in writing, the, defi the thing that defines my writing style, is trying desperately not to embarrass myself. So I don't want to write prose. I don't want to write, I'm, not, I'm never going to be Ray Bradbury, I'm never going to be Neil Gaiman, I'm not going to, you know, gas on about what the, the, what the wind feels like. But I'll, I'll do a picture of some leaves blowing. And I will hide behind the artwork as much as humanly possible. But people talk to each other. So I said, well, I can write dialogue because I know what I would say. I know what other people, what kind of other things people say. So I can make the characters talk like people. And because I was writing Hellboy, it's like, well, the first guy I know how to write is me. What would I say? So it's basically Hellboy's me, which I thought was funny because he looks like the devil, but he'll just sound like some normal schmo. <laughs> Did, uh, I, mean, I also heard that your father shows up in, in Hellboy as a, in the character. Yeah, there, the physicality of Hellboy. I know what Hellboy feels like because I know what my I, just, I remember what my dad's hands feel like, or felt like. You know, he was a cabinet maker. He had the, those, those kind of gnarly, hard, calloused hands. And he was one of those guys. He knocked around. He'd been around. I mean, especially as a kid, you look at him. You go, "Geez, he's been around for a thousand years." You know, he, he just had that thing of. You know, he's got his Korean War stories and stuff like that. And I said, "That's who I want this guy to be. I want him to be a guy." Which is why we jump over a big chunk of years. He shows up on the Earth in 1940 something, and when I first start writing him, it's 1994 or whatever. So he's been banging around, sleeping outside, and you know, hitting stuff with a rock for 50 years. So he's got that, he's already got that kind of tired, world-weary, been there, done that, nothing surprises me kind of, kind of shtick. It, it's, it's a really, it's a huge difference from the kind of super heroic stuff that you came from before. I mean, I think about, you know, Superman or a Bat, even a Batman, that, you know, have these like, you know, Hellboy has kind of sloped shoulders, you know, and kind of a kind of dum 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 kind of, you know, feel to it. And, and you know, that's not Superman, right? He's like, oh, it's so... So, so was that deliberate in, in terms of visual styling as well as the dialogue? Because I mean, Superman wouldn't say, "Hey, you got no pants," but he, you know, Superman also would have big, broad shoulders, right? Yeah, so. it's, I, it wasn't. So little of this was a conscious decision, but I was not a superhero guy. Uh, I read the stuff as a kid, as I was a kid, but by the time I was doing this stuff, I was not reading this kind of stuff. I don't have what keeps a lot of people in mainstream comics. I don't have that fan blindness. There's so many guys out there drawing superhero comics, specific superheroes, because, oh my god, I would do it for free because I get to draw Spider-Man. I don't have any of that. Uh, there's some characters that would be cool to draw once because I grew up with them. <clears throat> they don't need to make a career out of drawing that, that character. So, I didn't... There was nothing in me that said, I'm going to make up a superhero guy. I figured I would do help at once, nobody would buy it, and I would have to go back to drawing superhero comics. Hopefully Batman, because he's a black shape and that's... <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, there was a thing with Hellboy where I, it was like, well, let me put something out there that's as close as I can come at that time in my life to be exactly what I would do. Not, you know, I, there was no sense of I'm, I'm creating a commercial property. It's just I want something out there that shows what I can do, what I like. That's why there, there's you know, everything in the kitchen sink in those first couple Hellboy books. Because I'm just trotting out a, a catalog of shit I think is cool. Um, and so, what did you think was cool? I mean, it, it seems like you, you immediately, like, even from as a kid, you were uh, kind of obsessed with horror. Uh, kind of classic, you know, Victorian horror, um, early horror comics, uh, folk tales and mythology. Uh, it was that a continuing interest in your entire life, and you just wanted to draw monsters, or was there? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's it didn't go on my whole life. I mean, I wasn't reading you know Romanian folk tales when I was you know, twelve, uh, but I did read Dracula when I was thirteen, and that kind of set the stage. And you know, all my free time in, in high school and and you know when I was at, at arts and crafts, I spent all my weekends in Berkeley hunting through used bookstores and then going to the UC theater, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, and seeing the art house movies. So that there's a couple year period where my brain exploded discovering all that stuff. I, I gotta say, I was hoping, that, like looking through the CCA records, that we're gonna find some kind of goat sacrifice in your record or some kind of <laughs> Baal ceremony. Yeah, no, just boring, stupid, regular shit. Um, but, um, but, but, but these, these influences have stayed with you and then you uh, transformed them to Hellboy created a whole, then you start getting into kind of world building. Not so you're, <clears throat> you're writing your own stuff, you're cartooning, you're penciling, making your own stuff um, for creator-owned material, and then you start bringing in other creators to play in your sandbox. How did that start happening? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, I, well, the movie must have been on the horizon, uh, where we thought, I mean, Hellway had been around a few years. <clears throat> what happened is I created a team book. For whatever reason, because of a Marvel Comics kid, I still thought, this book, Hellboy, is really going to be about a team of guys, and Hellboy would just be like the muscle. Um, but almost right away, yeah, 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 but almost right away, I had no interest in any of the other characters. And Hellboy, as soon as I figured out who Hellboy was, he became really interesting. So the other guys just kind of went away. And I shouldn't say I didn't care about them at all, because I did know who they were, and I thought there was something there. And I had a skeleton of an, idea, skeleton of an idea of where things would go. But it was just, well, I hate to waste them. I feel bad for these guys. I made them up, and now I'm never going to use them again. <laughs> Maybe we could get somebody else to write them. And we tried two or three different guys, and finally found a friend of mine who was being mistreated at Marvel in DC. And I said, well, we won't give you that kind of shit if you, draw my, or if you write my stuff. And uh, that worked out. And so, I mean, have you been able to, I mean, because you've been working with some amazing people like you know, Guy Davis, and um, uh, so do you, how do you go about deciding who you're going to collaborate with or bring into this world? Um, it's, again, it started really small. Yeah, I'd always loved Guy Davis' work. So when we decided to spin up the BPRD, we, they, my editor picked a couple different artists, and, some, and, and they were fine, but, they, but one of the artists that we agreed on is, let's get Guy Davis. And when Guy did a, a story for us, I'm like, yeah, that, that's the guy. He's like, hands down, I think in comics, the greatest creature designer, which is why he's not in comics anymore. Because once you get a taste of movie money, you ain't ever coming back. Um, wait, don't listen to that, students. Do not listen to that. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so, uh, you know, so it started small. And again, I, I think I knew Guy a little bit, so, it's very, and it's so cliche to say, it's very much like a little family. So little by little, you you find different guys. Richard Corbin came in to draw Hellboy, and that was just one of those guys that grew up looking at his work. And somebody gave him a book of mine, and we swapped emails, and I sheepishly said, well, if you ever want to draw Hellboy, and he went, hmm, maybe we could do that. And I'm like, holy shit. So, um, you know, that happened. And, and, and at that point, Hellboy was generating enough of its own kind of you know, income and, and successful enough that you could actually start spinning off titles. And yeah, again, I, you know, I'd love to think I could have done all that stuff without the movie, but who knows? I mean, the movie certainly does shine a spotlight. There, there are downsides to the movie, one of which I'm going through today. Uh, minor downsides compared to the visibility it gives your character. Going through today? Entertainment Weekly. Their Comic Con preview issue, which I don't think anybody up there knows what Comic Con actually refers to. Uh, it's that convention about movies. Yeah. They had like the ultimate geek guide quiz. And there was a picture of Abe Sapien. Granted, it was a photo from the movie, but it was a picture of my character, Abe Sapien. And it said, which Guillermo del Toro character is this? And it's like, yeah. I, and I know that's a losing battle. That's what's going to happen. I remember saying to him one day, we were on the set, on the second movie, and I said, you know, you win. Because if I get run over by a bus, and it's an extremely slow news day, and they, 
they might just say, guy who helped Del Toro create Hellboy. Or if they actually are going to credit me and say creator of Hellboy, they won't show the comic. They'll show a still of Ron Perlman. You see it with Stanley all the time. Stanley, creator of the Hulk, blah, blah, blah. And bang, 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 bang. It's all movie images. So you're going to live in the shadow of that thing. And, and yet, I mean, I think of Cowboy as a comic book. I, I do. Um, it's certainly so do I. I think everybody here is. Why did you and not give him the card? I mean, not that he was like, but, um, but the, um, he would swear more than I do. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, you haven't dropped one F-bomb all the time. We have to check the tape. Right. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, but, but comics as a medium, I mean, you love the medium. Uh, do, you, do you find it uh, something that's can do some to kind of cre create different concepts and, uh, and characters that they could then be maybe translated to other media, but... Yeah, I mean, it was never my intention. I mean, when, you know, the, my favorite question was when people say, how did you go about creating a successful transmedia, blah, 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 you know, they, like, I called it Hellboy. Yeah. You don't, you don't <laughs> make something called Hellboy and say, and then when there's a cartoon and there's a movie, no, because you've already called it Hellboy. It's a stupid idea, and you came up with the stupidest name. <laughs> So you basically have said to the universe, I know nothing is going to happen. And if you're lucky, the universe goes, fuck you, I'll show you. Uh, uh, no, comics. Like, what, what about the medium? Yeah, I mean, the beauty is, unlike animation, unlike film, you can do it all yourself. You can tell a story, you can have complete control over every aspect of a story. Maybe you're going to collaborate with somebody on the color, and you're going to collaborate with somebody on lettering. That's three guys. That's an amazing power. Uh, you can't do that anyplace else. You can write a novel, but in the pictures. You know, it's, it's, you, can, you can control things in a way that you can't do in prose. Um, it's like making a movie, it's like you get to do it all yourself. You're, it's, a, it's a shitload of work, but it's possible, and it's cheap. Uh, which means there's no reason why you can't do it and get it out there. Um, and I don't know that I appreciated how great that was till I did work in film or animation where you're in there with a billion people and it's nothing but collaboration. So, so you were doing that, I, I read that about six or seven years, it seems like you were kind of not really making comics so much. You were, you were writing still f for the, some of the Hellboys titles, uh, kind of co-writing with a lot of stuff, but you were doing a lot of stuff with animation and film. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's misleading because my, I disappeared from drawing comics because I had a complete breakdown in confidence. I just, and I don't know what it was exactly. It, it timed out to be part of the second movie. Uh, so we were going to the second movie, which probably didn't help. Um, but I think it was even coming off the first movie, and having done a couple jobs I was really happy with, starting to feel like I can't top what I've done. And I'm sure there's some psychological damage that was done by having big ass Ron Perlman all over the screen. It, 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 I had a problem. I, I was drawing. I drew pages and threw them out. I drew half a comic and threw it out. I just, I'd lost that thing that just said, here's an idea, draw it. It was like, yeah, here's an idea, but maybe this idea is better, maybe that idea is better, and it just, and then I, at the same time, I'd come up with this big idea. But the drawing, the, the, the problems were drawing problems. Uh, the writing thing was still kind of okay. I think because I don't think of myself, I don't put as much pressure on myself as a writer, because I know I'm not very good. I just, Draw, I make a bonehead stories. So, but I made up a really big bonehead story, and I knew the amount of problem I was having with my own drawing and going into the second movie, there was no way I could do this big giant story. But I like this big giant story, so maybe I can find another artist. And that artist also was very slow. So it took six years for this artist to do this gigantic. So Duncan for Grado. Duncan for Grado. Um, where I got very lucky that he was available. He was a big fan. Yeah. Um, but by the end of that six years, I was really chomping at the bit to, to get back there. So, what, I mean, so what was the, 
Was it about uh, that initial kind of loss of confidence in your own drawing? Was that about just suddenly having all this attention thrown yeah, at you? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, just for whatever reason, I just thought I might never draw this stuff again. Um, I, I, was, I was just making myself sick worrying about stuff. And then at some point, I just stopped worrying. Also, I killed the character. Which helped. Because I thought, <laughs> if I go back, the beauty of having somebody else also, uh, somebody who's really good, Duncan Fogredo is an amazing artist, uh, having that guy come in and draw the book, suddenly you could do it. Hellboy in a car, <laughs> Hellboy gets a girlfriend, all these wonderful things you could do because you didn't have to figure out, because when I'm writing something, I'm like, da, 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 and then this happens, well, shit, no, I ain't drawing that. <laughs> That's not gonna but with Duncan drawing it, he's one of those guys, he can draw anything. You know, I can do anything. I can put in a bus full of schoolgirls. I'm not worried about having to do it. Um, but then I, at the end of that story, I killed him off. So when I would come back to drawing Hellboy, the idea was, I'm throwing him into hell, which really is the inside of my head. It's going to be made entirely of you keep as you go along. You keep redefining your ultimate goal. You know, when I in in '93, whatever, I thought Hellboy the way it was. That's I'd be happy drawing that forever. At some point, you go. Eh, I mostly just want to draw old houses and some <laughs> half sunken boats and uh, guys with you know animal heads walking around. Uh, so I will make him go there. <laughs> I, I think actually your hell would be a hell full of cars. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be. That, that's true. Uh, I, th I think, I mean, think about what I got away with in 20 years of doing Hellboy, other than the, the end when Duncan was doing it, uh, I think I drew three cars. And none of them were yeah, And it entirely took place on Earth. But he tended to go places. We never know how he got to places. <laughs> The magic, the magic of comics. And he tended to go to places where maybe a car would be sitting in a field in front of a guy's house. But, yeah. Well, we're all incredibly happy that you got back to drawing. Because it, it's a beautiful series. It's, and, I, and it really, this, again, this kind of remarkable kind of looking at, I don't know if you ever kind of look back at your own kind of life and career and the kind of self, you know, uh, kind of introspective kind of thing, but this like, you know, arc from, you know, uh, literally kind of inking someone else's lines to then penciling other people's creations and, and then you know, creating your own creator work, and then bringing other people to, to work on that, and then you're kind of, and then back to comics. It is pretty, it's a pretty big range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I, I've started doing these teaching things in the summer, just this week-long illustration master's class thing. And, you know, I, I tell my story. And it's, which is really about how do you, with my limited skill set, struggle into making a living get good enough at that or be in the right place where you can parlay that into figuring out what you really want to do and then getting away with doing that. Um, I think this talk I just did was called Stumbling Through a Career Till You Figure Out What You Want to Do and then figuring out how you can get paid to do that for a really long time. <laughs> um, it's a long title. It took a week to come up with that title. I was like, what the hell did I do? It's, it's not simple. Um, but yeah, there's only one, there was like really only one point in my career, because I was just stumbling along. And then I had done this big superhero book, that Cosmic Odyssey book, and suddenly I was known as a superhero artist. And that was the one time where I went, oh, I have to change that, because that's not what I want to be. I'm not good at it, and I don't want to be it. So when this Batman, Jack the Ripper, Victorian era thing came along, being lazy as shit, I knew it was going to be a nightmare. It's only going to be 48 pages, though. Uh, but I knew it was going to involve coaches and coach wheels, which are worst <laughs> car tires, because they got spokes and with horses. But I thought, yeah, the, but it's going to be foggy, so that's half the wheels. <laughs> I knew it was going to be there, it was going to be a city book, and there was no way to get around during the city. But I thought I got to do that to re-establish who I am. Um, well, we're glad you figured it out. So, um, but I took a while. Yeah. Um, I want to start opening it up to questions from the audience. So, if anyone has some questions, Mr. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I have two questions for you. The first one is really short. Um, the Amazing Screw-On Head is my all-time favorite comic. Like, it's fantastic. I have all the Hellboy stuff, but I love Screw-On Head. Will we ever see a second Screw-On Head? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm, can, I'm sorry, can people hear the question in the back, or should I? Okay, so um, so the question is about uh, a screw on, the amazing screw on the head, which was a, a, a kind of one shot that, that Mike did, and then there was an animated film. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> the animated film did serve a purpose. It made me realize after a couple of years that when people said they loved the amazing screw on the head, they were talking about the cartoon. I don't like the cartoon. I don't either. I've never seen it actually, but I'm sure I don't like it. Uh, but after Hellway became commercial, and while I still love doing it, at some point it's not that, oh, I'm getting away with murder job. It's your day job. It's your real job. So I thought, I will make up something, again, like I said, you know, you, at one point Hellway was the end all be all thing. But then I thought, well, what if I make up something that really is just made out of shit I like? And so it's weird Victorian stuff, and it's, it's like a puppet show, it's just this odd parade of stuff. People spouting nonsense, I wrote it in like a minute and a half, I had so much fun drawing it, I knew nobody would like it. Right away people say, it's the best thing you've ever done, here's an award, and we want to make a cartoon. Um, I've been very, very lucky, I've got to it. Um, but, but that character existed only for the length of that comic. Sometimes you do these guys, and you put them down, and they go, no, 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 I've got a million other stories. And sometimes you get to the end, and you go, oh, I'm just done. Uh, and I, I could force myself to come up with another story, but eh, it wouldn't be as good as the first one. Uh, I was just on for that period of time. And so when I collected it with a bunch of other odd stories uh, in, in a collection called The Amazing Screw and Head and Other Curious Objects, to, to, to follow up a little bit, you, you also collaborated with your then uh, seven-year-old daughter, Katie, on The Magician and the Snake. Which is the best thing I've ever done. She just told me, as I'm walking her, I can point out where on 7th Avenue in New York I was when she told me this thing, and I went, what? <laughs> but I just said I would, I would do a story for this anthology book, and they needed a five-page story, and I went, I'll do that. And she art directed me a little bit, because <laughs> it's about a magician, and I was going to do a Victorian stage magician. She goes, ah, it's got to have the pointed hat. All right, that's cool. Um, did it super fast. It was really interesting. I, I had a lot of guilt about spending a lot of time away from home at the time. And it's a sad, strange little story that really, it's like Little Prince. You go, this feels like it means something. It's so weird. It must mean something. So I was able to lean it just a little bit with what I was going through. And it's, it just came out, uh, yeah, it's my favorite thing. It's the only thing I would wear as a tattoo. Uh, which, which she and I will get matching tattoos. Uh, she's going to hold me to that. Is, she, she got an eye center for it. Alone. She did, seven years old. And is she going to write anything else? She, no, no, she did the classic. She's yes. like, like, I wrote one thing. Drop the mic. Critical claim, award, done. That shit looks like too much work. I don't know why you guys do it when they give you an award. Yeah. All right, another question. Um, so my favorite part about your work is the folklore that you incorporate into it. Do you have a favorite story that you just really love? Uh, so so the, the question is about the folklore um, elements in, in Mike's work, and is there a favorite uh, folkloric story that they <coughs> You know, at this point, all my favorites I think I've worked into Hellboy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's some odd stuff that it's, it's too weird that I would have to do separate from Hellboy. There's a bunch of Russian stuff that I'm kind of cooking up right now for another project. Um, but my problem is I read a lot of that stuff and I've used so much of it that I actually need to spend a big chunk of time reading more. My, my entire library at home is uh, uh, my folklore library. And I've been, you know, again, Berkeley and, and you know, used bookstores all over the country, I've been, I've been, you know, collecting all this stuff, especially if they're really small print runs, because then you go, now I know nobody's read this, so I look like a genius, and it's copyright free material, and, and the names are already in there, you don't have to make up fantasy names, I've made up two fantasy names, it's so embarrassing to do that, um, so all that stuff's there, ask Neil Gaiman, he looks like a genius, a lot of it copied out of a book, 
<laughs> Not to take anything away from Neil, but yeah, it's, 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 it's there to be used. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I like it. <laughs> and it's very comforting to look around the studio and go, there's a book on Italian folk tales that's that thick. I've never opened it, but I bet there's six or seven Hellboy stories in there. <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to have it. Another question. Um, can you give me more context about that? Because I found that really fascinating. I'm, for the record, I'm not really a Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu -Oh! fan. I, I don't even know what it is. The, 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 the question is, uh, there was a collaboration between the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh! It was an art exchange. It wasn't a collaboration. He, he wanted to draw Hellboy, and I said, oh, I would draw his thing. Uh, or I would draw Hellboy as a nod. I don't even remember. I, I do actually remember the piece I did. But I mean, it was just one of those things. I, somebody must have said, this guy's a fan, and could you draw something? And I went, yeah, I don't know what this thing is, but okay. It's just one of those weird things that happens. There's no, there's no story. <laughs> you play, uh, yu gi -Oh is huge. Yeah. 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 <laughs> with you, I can't remember what website, which is important, but one of the things that was mentioned in the interview um, that really stuck with me was where they asked you if you have any regrets, and you said that um, when you were younger, you had started working, and you thought, well, how come you couldn't have been better? And I kind of have that same feeling right now. I feel a little bit frustrated. I feel like as though I could be better right now. So I guess my question for you would be, um, if you could speak to your younger self, you know, right now, what would you tell your younger self at this point in time? What would you tell your younger self, basically? I, I, would I tell him that eventually he would have dinner with George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola? <laughs> <laughs> would, that, would that do him any good? Um, I think it would be, you try to tell him to be patient. You know, patience is hard. I was so, I, I was coming out of high school with ulcers because I wasn't as good as Frank Frazetta. Now, Frank was much older than me, and he's a legitimate freak. He's just one of those guys that pops up every hundred years. It's just out of nowhere. He's just a genius. Um, but I needed to be that guy. And it's hard, but it, it does force you to, to work really hard. So I was terrible, and I, I didn't want to always be terrible, so I looked at a lot of guys and tried to get better. It's just, but you can't tell a kid, be patient. You know, you're 17, you're 19, you know, you, it's, it's going to happen. I, uh, I talked to a, a girl when I was doing this teaching thing, and she's like her second year in art school, and she was saying, her teacher was saying, well, you've got to come up with a style. And I said, he's wrong. You know, you, you, a style happens. Nobody sits down and invents a style, or at least I've never heard of anybody good who ever did that. What I did do was look at her work because she looked like she was going to cry. You know, I looked at her work and I said, you know what, there's a style starting to be here. There's this embryonic style thing. Look at the way you do this. Look at the way you do that. Look at the way you do that. That looks like the way you naturally think. That's the way you naturally draw. That's starting to be a style. There's a lot of shit you've got to peel away and a lot of refining you've got to do to, to figure out exactly what that thing is. But here, I'll give you a couple names of a couple artists that it reminds me of, and you know, that's that's something. But it's it's you know, I wish I'd gotten there a lot sooner. I know guys that were really good, really fast, really early. Um, but it I was never good. It was always work. It takes time, yeah. Somebody wants to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, besides the unfortunate thing about, you know, like uh, having uh, Guillermo del Toro's sort of vision for your characters, like, you know, depicted in magazines and you know, stuff like that, do you think that the films were, how do you feel about the films being a faithful adaptation of your work? Okay, the question is whether the films are a faithful adaptation of the work. And more importantly, how do I feel? Oh, how do you feel about it? <laughs> this is a therapy session. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, 
They're not. The first movie, he was trying to please me, and the first movie is very collaborative. Um, I won more fights on the first movie. I bribed him into taking a couple scenes out of the first movie. He probably never would have shot them, but I couldn't risk it. So he owns a couple of really nice pieces of artwork by me. Um, <laughs> The second movie started out extremely collaborative. I mean, literally, we sat there going, what are we going to make for a second movie? And we came up with the story together, and then he scrapped most of that and went off in his own direction, because they were now his characters. Um, and that's rough. That's one where I kind of wish I'd gone, that's cool. You can do whatever you want. But I don't necessarily want to be ringside while you do it. Uh, that movie was rough. The first one was exciting because it was it was all like, oh, we can't believe we're going to do this, and you know, how are we going to make the hand work, and what's the makeup going to be like? So they were solving all these problems. The second movie was all those problems had been solved, and now it's just me trying to stop Del Toro from making the movie he was wanting to make, and that's that's rough. But so, you know, a lot of people like that better than the first one. I, there's things I like about both movies, but there's a lot more stuff. I, I lost a lot of fights on the second movie. Oh, um, I was wondering, just uh, since you created Hellboy and there have been uh, books and, and, uh, and films and a lot of different media that use the, the Hellboy character, character narratively, I was wondering if uh, you had anything to say about the idea of uh, reprocessing that character after it had left and came back, or do you just have one idea of who Hellboy is, and that's the one that the, the question is about whether, when the character goes off into another media, when it comes back to Mike, is, uh, does he have to reprocess the character, or does he just have a through line? No, he's always been my character. Um, when he was on the screen, he was Ron Perlman and Del Toro. He wasn't me. Um, the only changes I made after the film were things that were in the movie that I hadn't done in the comics. There were things, you know, mythological things uh, that, that I hinted at and Del Toro treated it in a particular way. Uh, some of those things I went back and dealt with in the comic to make it clear that my version was different than his. Uh, if anything, I, I wanted to reinforce the differences. I didn't want to, I certainly never wanted to take anything that Del Toro created and incorporate it into the comic. Um, fortunately, Del Toro was faithful enough to it, and certainly to the spirit of the comic, that you could, and a lot of people came to the comic through the movie, you could still recognize the character. It wasn't, it wasn't completely different. What's weird now is that people will come up to me who are fans of the comics and think they're commenting on things in the comic, but it's actually stuff from the movie. And that's the power of movies. That's why, you know, that stuff gets in your head in a way that a book can't, that a comic can't. It, it, these images of Hellboy with those fucking cats, you know, it's so <laughs> in there that they, you know, it doesn't matter how many times I've never drawn a, a cat in the comic, it's Hellboy and his cat. <laughs> um, those cats apparently smelled so horrible. They said you just you need a gas mask to be. I wasn't there that that week. I'm not sorry I missed that one. They were diseased Czechoslovakian cats. <laughs> brought it special to be smelly. Okay. Uh, back there. Um, so first off, uh, talk about gaslighting. Like, first comment that I ever read as a kid, and uh, I know you complain a lot about Second thing is, uh, having been an illustrator uh, for like a few years now, okay, um, like I'm always concerned with like the financial aspect of making comics and illustration. I mean, I'm sure you know there's people like, hey, let's go collaborate. And you're like, okay, but you know, what happens with these projects? Like, what's our business? What's, where are we going? Um, when the financial success is coming in, how do you deal with that? I mean, what do you tell yourself? <laughs> it's, it's it's, so, so, so I'm sorry. So the question is about: Is it demoralizing the kind of business aspect of, of making comics and illustration um, money, and not it's a demoralizing? Because your artwork might you know, get better, but it's just you know. 
Yeah, I, you know, again, I've been, I've been fairly lucky. Um, but, you know, what I, like I mentioned before, you know, when I went into comics, I knew I would never make any money. I knew I was going to live in a studio apartment. I was thinking I would live in a studio apartment in New York. I don't know if that would have worked out. But I, I, I was so bound and determined to draw what I wanted to draw and be in that particular business that I adjusted my life or my life expectations to, you know, hopefully be able to support that very meager lifestyle. Um, you know, but again, I, I was fortunate in that I, even when I did my creator own thing, I, I had a company paying me to do it. Um, so it's, it is, it's rough. It's, it's something I, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to, to, to speak to just because I, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, but I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, when I made up Hellboy, the look on my wife's face was, oh shit. It's a good thing we don't have kids. It's a good thing I'm working, but we're going to live in a studio apartment forever. Um, nobody was more surprised than she was that this thing, you know, worked at all. But she was very, she, she was supportive. When I was going to run back and do a Batman book after the first Hellboy, she said, no, you know, uh, stick with it and show the people that you're serious and you really mean it. And meanwhile, I'm going to keep my job. Um, she now works for me. Uh, which if anybody's married, they know that means I still work for her. <laughs> you can't really tell her to do stuff. You can suggest that certain things someone need to get done. But, yeah. How much of the development of your style came from uh, outside critique and not just yourself pushing all the time to change and develop? Like, did you have somebody come down, lay the hammer on you hard, and you say, Oh, you're right about all this, or you're fighting them. No. The, the question is about whether um, a, any outside critique helped in the creation of this uh, style. You know, I, I thought about this recently um, because I know so many people who, you know, who had somebody teach them how to do this, or they picked somebody's brain for how to do this and this and this. And I really never did that. And I went to school, and I had a couple of teachers that were supportive, and several who weren't. But I don't remember anybody telling me what to do. By the time I was in art school, um, it seemed like the teachers who understood what I was doing said, well, you seem to know what you're doing. Just do more of that. Uh, I don't remember being steered. I remember at Marvel Comics, it was confusing because I, I, somehow I thought, well, I need to draw a particular way to do this stuff. Um, I know I was handed certain rules at one point at Marvel that I couldn't function in. You know, they had this rule for a while there that if you put black, saw black in the background, you couldn't have any black in the foreground. It's a good general rule, but if you make it law, it doesn't work. And especially if you have a style that's entirely based on characters, you know, half bleeding into shadows. It just So I was out of marble for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, everything I've done has really come from studying other other artists and trying to figure out how and why they did stuff. I did have a guy, the first time I went to a convention and showed my artwork to some people, uh, there was an artist who looked at my stuff and said, you know, you're drawing barbarians and shit. You're, obviously, you're into Frank Rosetta. Go back and look at him for the way he spots blacks. And I'm looking at his paintings, but if you look at his paintings, it's strong black and white structures. I mean, he was a, he was a comic book artist. Uh, and and that level of simplicity is in his work, and that's what makes his work really strong. Then you look at guys like N.C. Wyeth, same thing. These guys have a real strong dark light sensibility. That was the one thing I remember somebody saying, go look at this guy for this particular reason. Um, you talk about having an inner struggle with your confidence level and throwing away pages you after you work on them, especially with your rather not your movie, uh, going all over the place. And I hear I hear from other successful artists or other creative individuals um, how that's a very common thing when they become successful. And is it an ongoing thing? And if so, how do you cope with that? So about confidence level and uh, how coping with that. It's so funny when I just did this, this teaching thing. After I did my talk, 
uh, a girl came up to me and said, I want to talk to you about how you, uh, you know, got over that confidence thing. And I said, didn't you hear what I was saying? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, at some point you just realize, I think I'm old enough now, I can bluff it through to the end. I don't have to worry about keeping my career going. It is the one thing that's very comforting about being as old as I am. You just go, ah, the, some of the money's invested, I think we'll be okay. But, uh, no, it's, it is, it is a, I mean, for me, it's a, it is a real struggle. And it just, it was so much easier when you're doing work and you're saying, I'll show you. I'm going to do this and I, and people are going to notice. But once people have noticed and once people have said really nice things, and especially if they say whatever really, really nice things and they give you awards and stuff, then you start going, oh shit, <laughs> they're going to find out. I'm a complete fraud. Uh, it helped when I talked to the guy John Byrne, who co-wrote Hellboy with me, who you know, was, at the time, one of the biggest guys in comics. And I remember talking to him about this, and he said, oh no, I feel the same way. You feel that you're going to be found out. Uh, but you have to remember that the public doesn't know you don't know what you're doing. And it helps, it helps to remember. <laughs> Recording this. I don't know if it's bad. Like, once, once I'm talking, I don't really hear what I'm saying. Um, it also helps to know that people only see what you do. They don't see what you're trying to do. And what I found comforting was I'm, I'm aiming for a particular ideal that I will almost never do. I'll never do a whole job like that. I might catch a bit of it here and there, where everyone else you do something, you go, oh, oh, that's what I'm trying to do, that little bit of it. Um, but at least you're aiming for something. And you just have to wrap your brain around the fact that you're never, you might get close. So is it one of those good old, like, make it till you make it sort of thing? Fake it till you make it? I, yeah, you know, I always thought there'd come a time where I'd say, I won the award, or I've done this, or I've done that. I am now successful. And that's why I went into therapy. Because I say, is there any way you can explain to me that I have become successful? We have a movie, we have a bunch of awards, we have this, we have this, we have this. Not only am I successful, am I ever going to feel like a grown-up? I'm married. I have a kid. He's 21. I have a mortgage. I still feel like I'm some little kid who's who's going to be found out. Um, so, yeah, for me personally, I, I'd love to think that it, nobody has it to the extent I have it. But I, you know, I struggle with it. It's just the last couple of years where I kind of go, ah, I'm, I'm closer to the end than the beginning. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, not dead. Not dead. But, but this is what I kept saying to my therapist is, I just want it to be over. <laughs> It's done. Like, I don't have to keep trying. And she did explain to me um, that you've achieved a certain level. And from this level, you can try other stuff. She, she used a mountain climbing analogy. Like, oh, you've this mountain, and you've, you've, you've gone halfway up the mountain, whatever, and you've established your base camp. And from that base camp, you can try to climb this peak, and you try to climb this peak. And the worst thing that happens, you're going to roll back down to base camp. And all I'm thinking is, I can fuck up so bad that I'm going to go off that thing, miss the base camp, and end up in the crater of a volcano over here. <laughs> she tried to convince me that that wasn't going to happen. Um, yeah, moving back to New York was, was, was rough. It was very expensive, and I thought, if I have a bad day, I'll be homeless. Again, it took the therapist and my wife, most of the therapists, because the wife doesn't want to talk to you at that point, explaining that if you have a bad day, we're not going to go straight from the two-bedroom apartment in New York to a cardboard box in the Bowery. There will be time to relocate to one of those cheaper states. <laughs> but I, I had that disaster mentality. So you must feel better about yourself. Everyone in the room must feel better about yourself. Yeah. Inspiring, uplifting stories. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got time for one more yeah, That'll question. do it. Want it? Uh, way back there. Uh, as someone who is debating on going to art school or not. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your thoughts were back in the 80s about going to school, and ultimately, 
what made you decide to attend CCA? A uh, question about going to art school. Well, I can't really say don't do it since I'm sitting in one, can I? <laughs> <laughs> we'll electrocute this, this I, for you. I won't be able to scrounge a ride home. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I went out of high school, uh, I went to a junior college for a couple of years and was really not planning on going to art school. Um, because I thought I knew what I was doing, which is a common mistake people make when they're 18, 19. Um, it was actually my father, well, I mean, I, I grew up in Oakland, so it wasn't a big stretch to go to Arts and Crafts, it was right down the road. Um, but my, I, you know, in my family, nobody had gone to college. And my father knew I was going to starve to death as an artist, so he said, go to school, um, get a teaching credential. Get some kind of a degree so you can get a teaching job, because the only way you're not going to starve as an artist. I never seriously thought about that. Um, but I went, and I learned a whole lot of stuff. And I, and I, I wish I had done it differently, because I went in as an illustration major at the time when arts and crafts was certainly not a school you went to for illustration. But I had one great illustration teacher there. Uh, there was another teacher there who taught anatomy, and he was into comics, so that was good. Uh, I met my best friend there. Um, you go and you soak up all the stuff it has to offer. Um, I wish I'd done more life drawing. I wish I'd done painting. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be gained there. A, a broader spectrum of things you're going to get there than you would if you were just trying to learn stuff on, you know, on your own. Especially if you're lazy and scared of everything like I am. You know, I would never try painting and things like that if it wasn't something I had to do in school. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure it did me some good. On, on that note, let's uh, all a, a good round of applause for... <laughs> First, we want to say thank you so much, both to Justin and Mike, uh, for doing a great job up here tonight. Um, a couple quick notes. We're doing this every Friday this month, so we're back here next Friday with an amazing uh, artist, writer, and publisher, Spike Trotman, and the opening of our second year uh, cartoonist gallery show, which will happen that night as well. Um, but tonight, we're going to have a short reception over at our home base, The Writer's Studio. You're welcome to stop in and meet some of our cartoonists and say hi to Mike and Justin and all of us. Um, it is at 195 Deharo. It's uh, about one block that way and right. You'll see kind of a crowd of people moseying down there. And um, hopefully you'll say, say hi and uh, shake some hands and, and uh, we'll get to know you better. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you.